months. This week, comic books, because the distinction between high and low culture art is minimal and elitist. Now, we try and be quite inclusive on this channel. We talk about the audios, the books, the short stories, maybe even the stage play. But I'd wager that the most unappreciated, neglected medium is the comics. What you got against comics, huh? I'm just not a comic person. They're designed for a younger demographic. They're just really inaccessible and hard to get into. Well, yeah, I'm okay, that last one's fair. But lately, recent runs have been so successful you can buy them from your local book retailer. I recently got a whole bundle of them on Humble Bundle for, what, pennies? And what I've been rewarded with is simply some of the best Doctor Who content I've read in years. It is insane how rooted these are to my childhood. And yet, although they're comic books, I actually don't think I appreciated them enough as a kid. Because this series has attracted some major industry talent. There are three major outlets when we look at Doctor Who comic book history. Doctor Who magazine and their monthly comic strip has detailed classic and current Doctors as they appear. There's IDW Comics, who had the brand for a short period of time, and questionably kind of flubbed it. But most recently, Titan Comics, who have just gone to town with this IP. 10, 11, 12, 9? There's more 9 content in the world? Yes, please. 8? So even the third Doctor, they're really having fun, and just pushing it with all the nerd references they can fit in. Sutek, the Nyman, Harry Sullivan. Oh, the ninth Doctor just met Martha, but now she's a gargoyle. You can get away with absolutely anything, and that can sometimes be these stories undoing. But good or bad, I've never felt like I'm wasting my time with these. These are so clearly penned by fan authors. And the idea of people missing out on these and just dismissing them wholesale breaks my heart. Yeah, comics have a bit of a tendency to get bogged down in their own mythology. They're very reference heavy. There was a time when the 10th Doctor was turned into the 9th Doctor, and it lasted for about four pages. The stories are just mental. Most of the time in a very, very good way. A lot of these stories combine the frantic tone and pace of the new series adventures with the aesthetic and style of perhaps a Marvel book. If you're going to get industry level talent, yeah, get the guy who wrote for Loki and then bring him over to the 11th Doctor stories. What a perfect match. What's that? Budget? <laughs> I don't think so. If you can visualise it in comics, it can happen. I think if you nail the tone, if done well, comics are the ultimate medium for Doctor Who. Totally unbound. The only necessity or brief to match is that of a good story. And the comics have them in spades. I always said, Moffat, Chibnall, the showrunner should use the comics as a backbench, a potential writing board for who has the real good ideas. In fact, penning this video was actually tricky because it was tough to find five comics I didn't like. I had to really go digging for them. They're out there. But I had to go digging. Honestly, I don't know where to start. I'm filled with optimism. The Brigadier, the Slovene, Adam Mitchell, David Bowie as a companion of the 11th Doctor. Ark, 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 ark. This is Ark, sentient goo companion, and sometimes a bull. Oh look, and even Jenny is back. Fuck Jenny. The Skith are still my favourite childhood villain, and it makes me sad that most Doctor Who fans have never heard of them. Be aware, although I've done my reading, there is zero chance of anybody having read all of these and having a comprehensive knowledge. These things stretch from Doctor Who Adventures, black and white comics from the 80s, Christmas Doctor Who annual stories from the 60s, hell, even Marvel had their go at it. But Sam, how does this fit into my canon? Excluding the weird 80s stuff and that one Star Trek crossover? Sorry, can't get over that. These stories support the core TV show seamlessly. <gasps> New companions? Yes, but the amount of creativity, variety on display here is phenomenal. So with that in mind, let's <laughs> venture into the very worst. Number one, the twist. Okay, I'm just going to show you a random panel. Now, how can that panel come from a poor story? The artwork, tick. The Doctor in his retired rockstar roots, tick. A beautiful inspired location, absolutely tick. This story's greatest strength is also its greatest weakness. The environment is too spectacular and cool, and it's very distracting. We have a new companion in the form of Hattie, which is the first companion post Clara? Don't get too bogged into it. 
Hattie is a bass player and a famous one of that. The image of these two riffing away in the TARDIS is just... class. She's actually a great match for him, but you wouldn't know it from this story. As a great environment, slowly just devolves into a story about fox people. Oh, okay. Um, I don't like batting 12 stories, especially Titan stuff. These are people who know what they're doing. The illustration, <coughs> no complaints here, it's brilliant. Catching Capaldi's likeness and that fierce intensity in his manic persona is right there on the page. Oh yeah, no doubt, you can hear Capaldi's voice emanating from the pages. But a good doctor does not a good story make. It doesn't upset, irritate, or bore me, it just kinda loses me. This is an average plot with beautiful artwork. Followed by, oh, one of the best stories ever. I guess I still recommend the twist. Number two is FAQ. This is a Doctor Who magazine title with Ten and Rose, so we're in peak series two annoyingness. This week for Doctor Battles, uh, entitled Fan Culture. Hmm. Well, one entitled fan at least. Yikes, way to alienate your comic book audience by having the main villain as a comic book loving kid? <sighs> Read the room. To this story's credit, it has a really fun visual style. There's samurais and ninjas and giant fighting robots because it all comes from the imagination of a young boy. All the adults are gone. There's people in trees. The unfolding mystery of the story is good, but then it lasts about five pages and it ultimately disappoints. That, and the fact that it's very blatantly, has a lot of similarities with Fear Her. Yeah, it's a poor man's Fear Her, where Rose gets zapped away instead of the Doctor. And this troubled kid who's been lied to and is lonely. It's been done better before. And that was Fear Her. I don't know if you've seen Fear Her. It ain't a strong app. Then there's the Nightmare Game. Uh, the Nightmare Game is probably a good comic. I have no nostalgia or memories of 1970s football magazines. Did they have comics? I think the context of this one is lost to time. Or maybe I'm just giving this story a bit too much credit. It's just silly, and I like pastiching the past and the silliness of past comics. But then I actually went and read a bunch of old retro Doctor Who comics, and they were not that goofy. So as a result, I'm not quite sure what this 1969 story is pastiching, but it's not Doctor Who. This story does not fit the Eighth Doctor. For number four, I was planning to put a story called The Reunion of Fear, where all the survivors of Platform 1 are hunted down, and the villain is the Mox of Bahoon's fucking dad or something. I don't remember, it's a very faint memory. But then I thought, Sam, get a grip, this was in the comic pages of Battles in Time. The, the Doctor Who card game from 2006. So, considering the demographic, small kids, I think they did just fine. So instead we're going to talk about a property not designed for kids, designed for adults, or at least very edgy teens. Absalom Dak, Dalek Killer. <laughs> oh god. Introduced by the Doctor himself in the pages of Doctor Who magazine, and then reprinted by Marvel. Dak is a really fun and embarrassing part of Who history. A sweaty, shooting, drinking bad boy. A convict and a mercenary. When else could this character have been created other than the 1980s? I appreciate the audacity of swapping out the charismatic, charming city lead for a muscle and gun type, but then also thanks, I hate it. This Dalek slaying bastard jumped out of the pages of a 2000 AD comic. But what's staggering is that he's come back so many times with the 7th Doctor, with the 11th Doctor, and he was even in Time Heist. This big macho character takes himself so seriously. Do I have to say any more? The fact that he's then battling like classic retro Daleks is just a silly image to me. It's the fact that this story is trying so hard to be cool that actually makes it one of the lamest pieces of Doctor Who media. And hey, it's sci-fi, it's Doctor Who. Over the years, they can and will try everything, which includes this. And in the same way Doctor Who didn't mesh with cyberpunk, it also does not mesh with 2000 AD Warhammer style visuals. Judge Dredd, this is not. But anything, anything that this hilarious character is in, I will read and laugh at, but probably not for the right reasons. And number five, the worst comic story, The Forgotten. Unlike these other four, this one has almost nothing redeeming in it. From the art, to the very premise, to the 
blatant fan wank. This is the most fan wank piece of media you will find in the Doctor Who continuity. The Tenth Doctor and Martha wake up in what is essentially a Doctor Who museum. That's already tacky, but let's go on. The gang are then attacked by Metabila's free spiders, sand miner robots, and clockwork droids. Because, you know, Doctor Who. Every issue seems to follow the Tenth Doctor just walking through past memories of a previous generation as monsters from that era come and attack them. And that's basically it. Until it gets worse. Behold, it is the Metacrisis Tenth Doctor. Now with a beard. Now as a villain who has come to claim the Doctor's remaining regenerations. <sighs> but better still, he's an amalgam of the Master, the Valyard, and the Metacrisis Doctor. So I guess he's just the Valyard now. What bullshittery is this? It's like the worst idea of celebration possible, just throwing a bunch of Doctor Who elements. It's the Ready Player One of Doctor Who. Hey, remember the chameleon arc? Hey, remember the jelly babies? Remember the Valyard? Remember Susan? Oh yeah, Susan gets a send off in this, which would be fine, but I don't want it handled by this writer in this story. No thank you. The title is too accurate. It's way on the nose because here's a bunch of discarded Doctor Who elements thrown together and hoping it makes a cohesive whole. Unless you're a younger reader who gets something out of pointing at the page and going, oh, I know that and there's not a lot of appeal here. See, this is what happens when you put the IP into the wrong hands. Thank you, IDW. I hate it. This is the most egregious example of fan wank ever. It tries to be a love letter to the series in all the wrong ways. Trivia, callbacks, references are not a replacement for a good story. Alternatively, the webcomic The Ten Doctors is probably one of the best. A Doctor Who fan webcomic by Rich Morris, a story that encompasses almost every classic villain, almost every companion, and every Doctor up until the point it was written in 2007. So how is this any different? Number one, the fact that it's fan made really does come into it. This is a story on a massive scale, but treats itself very humbly. Because although everyone might be back and the stakes might be high, everyone's just hanging out talking, problem solving, having all the interactions you want them to have, and then they get split up into pairs, which is just adorable. Some incarnations get along just like you wish they would. The basic artwork is so expressive. And the then current Doctor coming out of the events of Runaway Bride gets some really sweet interactions with the first Doctor. And I think it's because of that sketchy art style that actually works to its own merit. This is probably a hard sell, but it shouldn't be. You can read it online for free right now. It's 247 pages long with a pretty comprehensive story. It's a light, jovial, almost hypothetical read that does not take itself nearly as seriously as these stories. It's a pleasure to read, and I loved this thing as a kid. Unofficial fan works might seem easy to dismiss, but Morris is a more talented fan than you and I put together. It might be outdated, but many consider it the unofficial 45th anniversary of the show. Number two, The Woman Who Sold the World, the first Doctor Who magazine outing of Martha. Now, I'll be honest, I think the Tenth Doctor, through all of his flaws, has the best comic book stories ever. No other Doctor holds a candle. The first, Hotel Historia, Death to the Doctor, and The Crimson Hand. Hey, if you don't know who Magenta Price is, I recommend finding out right now, as she is objectively the Tenth Doctor's best companion. But the woman who sold the world is just magical. It takes full advantage of its comic book ambitiousness and definitely visual style and delivers a really magical and satisfying conclusion. I just love stories where A, the Doctor and the Companion are split up for almost the entire runtime, and B, when the Doctor fixes a society from the inside before leaving. It's just a very sweet notion that an outsider could come in to a broken world and from the outside, all of this society's problems could be solved in the matter of a day. This is a story that is a vivid setting. But unlike, say, the twist, it's an environment which propels the characters and the story rather than the other way around. Sweet Pea, the Prime Minister, who has access to a battle mech, faces extinction as her people are wiped out because of an insurmountable debt. Yes, the villain is capitalism on autopilot. None of this both sides shit, uh-uh. 
There's a fun, frenetic pace that the BBC couldn't do. There's a scale and visuals that the BBC could not afford. And the ending is so genuinely sweet, it almost brought a tear to my eye. As a kid, <laughs> at the age of 11, I gave this story a 2 out of 10 in Doctor Who magazine. Can you believe it? I think I was being a bit harsh. Number 3, In Their Nature. Oh. I'm giving a lot of lip service to new series Doctors. The fifth Doctor and his iconic TARDIS crew land in the middle of a Rutan Santaran battlefield. And first things first, I adore this art style. Five and the gang look just adorable here. You've made Tegan and Adric seem appealing. Congrats! It's only a short story, but the point is made, and it's made hard. Only 10 pages to convey your plot, and I still feel like this trench dodging, side swapping archetype of a Doctor Who story does more in 10 pages than some stories do with 6 episodes. The fifth Doctor, as an ally, as a friend, gives them tactical battle advice, before ultimately realising it's in vain, it's futile to stop these guys from going out to the battlefield and killing themselves in an act of stupid glory. Which is sad, this story makes you care about a legion of Sontarans, because they are noble. Between this and the betrothal of Sontar, I think I'd just like me some good boy ally Sontarans. They might be clones, but it gives them so much more depth when not all of them are evil little bad eggs. It's so understated, it doesn't tell us anything new that we don't already know, but it's just such a sweet little piece. The Fifth Doctor might not understand war, but that doesn't mean there isn't nobility and bravery shown within it. Just that tiny bit of common ground makes the story brilliant. I guess it's just in their nature. Complete recommend. Whew, for a video about comics, this has gone on very, very long, and I do not apologise. Some other great stories include The Four Doctors, Serve You, The Infinite Corridor, A Groat's Worth of Wit, Doctor Mania, The Curious Tale of Spring-Heeled Jack. But for my money, number four goes to The Weapons of Past Destruction. Jack takes the Ninth Doctor into a auction, a black market seedy kind of deal where people are auctioning weapons from the Time War. Thank you, Titan, that there is more Ninth Doctor in the world, and because we don't need Christopher Eccleston for this product, they can just keep going and going and going. This story is on a very big scale. If it was part of a TV show, it would be a season finale. There are two emerging celestial factions fighting on who gets to become the new Lords of Time. Very high concept story, I'm into it. I don't get why people want to call stories like this non-canon or unofficial because oh my god, this story lends and develops the Doctor so much more than most of the core TV stuff does. It's just a great story that really focuses on the repercussions of such a giant event as the Time War. And also, I can't say no to that big stupid grin. And last of all, the heartbreaking, the beautiful, one-shot story, The Time of My Life. Donna Noble recounts her various adventures with the Doctor, a bunch of off-screen adventures we've never seen, exploring different art styles, as the world and reality seems to break down around them. It's not clear what's happening until the final panel. And it's a gut punch. Donna Noble left him one last message in the TARDIS, and <laughs> it speaks for itself. This was a long one, I don't think I anticipated just how big a subject this would be, but it certainly is a neglected one. Thank you for watching.